everyone. We are here on our German farm. Joining us today is Karen, one of our interpreters who has a lifelong interest in ceramics and use of ceramics. She's done a lot of baking, especially here. You may have seen her on the African farm, maybe on the German farm, even out in the 1820s farm, doing some baking or cooking and using ceramic objects. Also, she's also a collector of some ceramic objects. So let us ha ask Karen some questions about why ceramics are important and why we're talking about them for Archaeology Day. So Karen, you've got a lot of objects on this table. You want to tell us about some about the array of colors and the different types we might have? We have several different kinds of pottery here. Um, a lot of them are kind of reddish in color and these are often called redware. Um, it's also called earthenware and these ones here, like this one right here, this little pipkin, that is not red in color, is still a type of redware, it's a type of earthenware. Earthenware is probably a better term. They're made out of clay, and clay comes in reddish colors because it contains a lot of iron in it. If a clay source has not very much iron in it, it might end up being this different kind of color. Could be more pink, could be more brown, could be sort of yellowish. All depends on what kind of chemicals, such as iron, are found in naturally occurring in the clay. We can also end up with colors because of the glazes. So for instance, this little dish right here obviously has a lighter colored clay body with no iron in it really, but it has a green glaze. So the green glaze would be made from ground up copper. In addition to green, you might find a blue glaze. This is done with cobalt. You might find kind of a yellowish slip glaze. This is just a yellowish clay that's been thinned out to make a slip decoration. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's actually some green on there as well uh, as, as decoration. And then we have, sometimes we have a dark glaze, and this can be made from manganese, most often probably from iron. One of the clues that I find really intriguing is that certain, certain things will tip you off as to what time period an object comes from. For instance, an edge that's kind of pinched like this or pinched like this edge is a clue that these pieces are probably styled in a 17th century style. I should say right now that all of these pieces that are out here on the table and on, on display are reproduction items. They're not original artifact pieces. So these have been made by someone today copying the styles, in this case, a 17th century crop, okay? So these are all modern made pieces. So we have different colors of clay, we have different colors of glazes, and of course the glazes and the colors are just because human beings like color, because we like things to be different. We like things to be pretty. They don't have to have these designs on them, but we human beings, we like them. Okay, so we have different kinds of clay. We also have some other, other items. On the bench there in front, you'll see two plates and a little mug, and those are later ceramics of different styles. I'm not really gonna talk about them too much. Um, they would be more of 19th century type of items. Um, I'm also gonna talk just briefly about how the clay is processed. In Europe and in North America, European style pottery was shaped either by hand or on a wheel or by rolling it out flat, however it was shaped. It was allowed to dry and then it was fired once in a kiln at a pretty high temperature. It's allowed to cool, then it's removed from the kiln and glazed with a slip glaze that's made from grinding up minerals and ores. And we end up with a glaze that provides the shiny look. As you can see here, uh, maybe in the sunlight, it shows up from my angle quite nicely. Nice shiny shine from the different, from the clear glaze. So this has a clear glaze on it. This has a green glaze on it just to kind of clue you in what's happening there. After it's been glazed and the glaze is allowed to dry, the pottery will be fired again, a second time in a kiln. And at that point then it comes out looking like this. Okay, 
Most items that are meant to contain any kind of liquid or any kind of food substance will be glazed on the inside. They may be glazed on the outside. This type of pottery can be cooked in, can be baked in, and can be cooked in. You can take a skillet like this, set it down. You see the legs on it there? Pretty handy. Uh, you can set this down over a bed of coals, hot coals from the fire, and cook something. If I try to place this skillet over flames, it's probably five seconds, maybe 10 seconds, I will hear a little popping sound, a little snapping sound. And if there was any liquid in the skillet, immediately after that popping sound, I will hear a sizzle because this skillet will have completely split in half. It doesn't take much. Um, and that, of course, is speaking from experience. My African pot here, on the other hand, is made by mixing clay together in a different way. And it has ground up rocks, sand, rocks, broken bits of pottery, shell. It has other stuff in it that's called temper. And that will allow this particular piece of pottery to act differently than this kind of pottery over um, heat. This kind of pot can be placed over flames. This is an African cooking pot. Native American cooking pots act the same way. This is fired at a lower temperature, much lower temperature, and fired only once. It's not glazed, and it contains temper. There's a bit of a, a cracked area on the rim here. If you could come and look close at it, you would even see little bits of things like sand in there. You'll notice that this pot also has a completely round bottom, and so I have to set it on a little ring there to keep it from falling over sideways. Um, this is really an interesting and, and fun thing to cook in. Works very differently. I really enjoy working with that kind of pottery. Okay, so we can bake in things. Just to, just to name some of these baking items, this probably looks pretty familiar to cooks out there. We probably call it a bunch pan. The old name for it is a Turk's cap pan. This is a late 18th, probably early 19th century one. And this was actually made by Potter about 40 or more years ago in North Carolina, reproducing Moravian style pottery. This is a 19th century, mid 19th style, same type of pan, okay? But made slightly differently. Um, this is a German style pan, and I would still call this a Turk's cap pan or just a cake pan. And um, it's a lot easier to get the cake out of this one than it is out of this one, I will say that. Um, small dishes like this could be used for a, a cake. I could put my cake batter in here, pound cake, whatever. I could put it in there. Um, I could put it in one of these. These are all baking dishes. This um, counts as a baking dish. This would make a lovely pie pan. Easy to get the slice of pie out. Works really well for that. This little guy right here kind of functions like the Pipkins. I can take just a piece, a couple of hot coals, set it under there. It's a tiny little brazier. One of the things you might consider using a brazier like this or these small Pipkins for is for making a sauce of some sort of melting butter, uh, heating up a small amount of water or milk or something like that. It's kind of hard to make a meal out of this, but you could work with sauces and things like that with those pots. Um, you could, if you have a big pipkin, and there are big pipkins, you could cook soup in a pipkin if you needed to. Um, this is a cooking pot right here. This can set on a trivet over coals, or you can set it right beside the fire and let your, whatever it is you're cooking, heat up in there slowly. You might put a plate over it to keep the heat inside. Works pretty well. This is an interesting one right here. This is a pudding pot. This is styled after New England style. Um, cooking things. This is, if you know what brown bread, brown bread is, Boston brown bread, you could put, you grease this up really well, put your bread dough down, bread batter down in there, put it in a cast iron pot. I put some rocks in it to hold it steady. I put a plate over it to keep the moisture out of it and steamed it in a cast iron pot. It worked 
really well, and it came out really well. I was delighted with that. Something like this can be used to store liquids. Most often, a jug like this would be used to store vinegar. Everybody wants vinegar in the kitchen, have to put cork in it, of course. Um, another version of a stoneware jug that could be used for vinegar is this fancy one down here, often called a Bellarmine jug or a Bartman jug. It has the little face on the front there, um, and that's uh, a, a representation of the German Green Man from mythology. It is October, and I will just say that in some families, they might have taken a jug like this and filled it with interesting things like nails, perhaps iron nails or urine, and stoppered it up and kept it in the house as a protection against witches. It's October. We need to think about these things in October, right? Um, so let's see. So we have, uh, as I was talking about baking things, I've mentioned uh, the drinking mug, and then we have some other drinking utensils down there on the, on the bench. This is actually a tea bowl or even used for coffee. It would have a little shallow saucer with it, um, but it's also used for baking or can be used for baking. If you look in old cookbooks, you'll find receipts or recipes for cupcakes. And we all know what cupcakes are. We have special pans for cupcakes. But back in the day, they didn't have those special pans. And so they would bake cupcakes in cups. I've done it. They're really cute. So. Obviously, you need to have more than one cup if you want to make a lot of cupcakes. So that's also a, that's a that's a baking item as well as um, drinking tool. So the vinegar jugs are used for storage. Other things were used for storage as well. Food like we're here on the German farm. Uh, everybody associates sauerkraut with Germans. Uh, sauerkraut could be made in a large stoneware jug or a wooden tub and it would be being made about now um, to be stored for the winter. It would be an important foodstuff. But you can use smaller crocks for all kinds of things. Germans are also making things like plum butter and pear butter and apple butter um, in, the, in the fall season, and they could store it in something like this. You would take a cloth and pull over it, tie it down to keep dust and bugs and such out of it. So crocks come in different sizes, and. Um, I, I like pipkins a lot, and I have a lot of pipkins. I also kind of like crocs. So I have a kind of a timeline here of crocs. Let's see if I can get them to where you can see them all. Remember what I said about the little pinched rim here? That's a 17th century croc. This is an 18th century British croc. This is also British, okay. This is kind of late, eight, 17th century, 18th century, so it's kind of in between there. This is Delftware, originally from Holland. This is um, a sort of a transitional croc. It's um, American, and it's late 18th century into the early 19th century, but it also might be found in other, other parts, in Europe as well as in America, but it was pretty common in, in North America. And then this is a 19th century storage croc, first part of the 19th century, and this is a mid-19th century storage crock, which I just bought because I thought it was adorable. You'll notice the one thing in common that all these crocks have is an edge around the top. Remember I mentioned you would tie something over to keep dust and dirt out, and mice, and things like that. You, so you want a little edge, so all these crocks have an edge around them. Talked a bit about stoneware versus redware already. Remember, this is stoneware, this is redware or earthenware, okay? I mentioned using this for vinegar. I would not put vinegar in a crock like this. The vinegar, this clay body is porous, whereas the stoneware body is not porous. Just to point out what I mean by porous, if you've ever seen a clay flower pot, that is made out of clay that was fired once and not glazed. And I think we've all seen a clay flower pot. When you put it in water, it immediately turns dark because it soaked up water. Everybody's had that experience, I think. Most everybody. 
So that is actually happening with this clay too. Even though it's glazed completely inside and out, the, the glaze and the clay are still porous. And so certain substances, porous to certain substances, they can kind of work their way through the glaze, through the clay, to the outside. Some things that can do that really well are things like fat, like beef tallow or lard. They will just soak through, even, even a crock like this that's glazed inside and out, and if it was only glazed on the inside, oh yeah, really, really oozes through that. Vinegar would do the same thing. Vinegar would permeate this whole structure here, and then whatever you put in this crock afterwards would be affected by the presence of that vinegar in there. So if you put uh, anything, if you put milk in here after it had contained vinegar, it would probably turn the milk. If you only had vinegar in there for two seconds, it might not. But if you stored vinegar in here long enough for it to permeate through, then the only thing you could use it for was vinegar. Something like this, made out of stoneware, will not absorb the vinegar like that. So I could put tallow in this because it's stoneware. I could put lard in this because it's stoneware, but I wouldn't put it in this or this. I'm not sure about this. I wouldn't, just to be on the safe side. I could put tallow or lard in this crock right here. So what do I use these for if I'm not gonna use them for um, uh, tallow or fat of any kind or vinegar? Well, I'm gonna use them for probably preserves, okay? Sauerkraut, I could make sauerkraut in this, um, but the clay ones here, jam, jelly, um, syrups of various sorts, um, any kind of any kind of anything that you made that needed to be stored, you could put in there. You could put dried things in there, cover it up nice and tightly, uh, and hope to keep it dry. Um, so they are storage crops. Uh, they're not flower vases. <laughs> it might work really well as a flower vase, but that's not really what they're for. All right. Um, then I have a couple of strange things here. This is a little fat lamp or grease lamp. Um, there would be a piece of, it has a little nozzle right here, a strip of linen cloth is fed down through there and the fat is set in there. You would light the piece of cloth, it would draw up the, the melted fat and, and produce a light. It's not a very good light, but it's better than nothing in the dark. And then this is a really interesting thing right here. In um, Germanic and Scandinavian and Eastern European parts of Europe, um, they made clay tile stoves. Some of them were very elaborate, um, very, very elaborate. Some were very plain. This was kind of a, a in between. So this is a clay, this is a clay tile for a tile stove, which would function very like a modern cast iron stove. Uh, as long as the fire is burning, it would be radiating warmth into the room. It's a pretty good system. We have a lot of pottery here at the Frontier Culture Museum. We do get our pottery from several different sources. Our curator tries to balance it out. We cover several different time periods. Obviously, we also cover other continents. For instance, our African cooking pot um, was made in Africa and shipped here to the museum. Most of the things on this table, which are mine, are from Westmore Pottery. Westmore Pottery is located in Seagrove, North Carolina, and they specialize in reproducing 17th, 18th, and 19th century pottery, both earthenware and stoneware. Um, for anybody who's interested, uh, they do a lot of work for museums, and they do a lot of work for people who just really like this kind of pottery. I mentioned that I can cook with some of these things, for instance, my cake pan here, this cake pan, this little dish right here, um, this I said this is a pie plate. Um, I can cook with these in a historic kitchen using a historic bake oven or cooking over coals, however I cook with them. I cook with all this sort of, I've cooked with every one of these pieces 
uh, in that historic tradition. But some of these pieces can also be used in your modern kitchen at home. This skillet right here is clearly not going to work on top of your stove. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that. I wouldn't advise that. But if you go camping, remember it has to go over coals. Only coals, no flames. That's one reason why you don't want to put it on top of your fire. But I can cook with this in my oven as if it was made out of whatever your cooking pans are made of. It works just fine. The one thing I will caution you about is that stoneware cannot go in the oven. It cannot be used for cooking. Uh, it's a storage type of clay. <laughs> Meant for storage, not for cooking. These little guys right here, even though they're not that reddish color, they can go over coals as well. Remember, the only thing that can go over flames is my African or my Native American style crockery. This is made out of stoneware. Why would you cook in it anyway? It's got vinegar in it, right? Um, this could be heated up if you wanted your beverage hot. It could be heated up. I wouldn't suggest the blue willow or the creamware or the mocha or the stoneware beer. Beer stein there, those should not be placed over heat. Okay, so it's a particular passion of mine, both using and collecting pottery. Um, if I didn't have one before, I'll probably buy it. Um, I do like them, I probably uh, have too much of it, but um, it's an interesting th thing to have on hand. And when I go camping, I'm set. I'm set. Thanks for watching this little video and don't forget you can come and see us at the museum. You can watch us cooking with things like this and you can see, this, see the items up close and personal. Have a good day.